All right. Welcome back. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. We are back here on the Punching In Podcast. My name is Richie. I'm here with my esteemed co-host and interview guest, Daniel Son. Welcome, Daniel. Great to have you. Great to be here, Richie. Thanks. <laughs> you look great. You gain weight? <clears throat> All right. So today we're going to mix it up a little bit. There's no interview guest. Nobody's worthy to come in today. So uh, it's just going to be me and you chopping it up. We'll talk about this week's UFC card, Bellator card, got LFA. There's a one card going on, I think, Friday morning and uh we'll drop one of your stories and we'll try to get some questions in that people have uh have asked so we'll try to get to those as well so tons of shows and no off season who doesn't love mma no shit right yeah um you want to hit the uh well lfa's first right so we uh, got friday night's lfa and bellator yeah and i think one fc is for friday morning overseas so we just have one guy fighting in one fc marcus Puchecha. he's one and oh there now Looks like he took a sh relatively short notice fight. Can't see, no. One FC is a little unusual in that regard. They either have short notice fights or fights that, you know, you got them. Six months apart? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. So he's fighting uh, Ji Wong Kang, who's 5-0. and oh. um, Looks like he's primarily a striker out of South Korea. And uh, obviously we know what Bichetch's game plan is going to be for that one, Dan. Yeah, I mean, all of all of uh, Kang's wins are by knockout and or ground and pound and you know, you know what Bucic is going to do. That guy is an absolute wizard on the ground, which, yeah. you know, it's one thing to be that good on the ground, but to be that good and that big on the ground, that, that guy's kind of a unicorn in that regard. So uh, style versus style. Yeah, takedown, clinch, mount, head and arm choke. That's what I'm going to call. I'll take it. Where do I sign? Yeah. And it's kind of funny. We talked about Bucic. He had that great quote when he was talking about training here um, and his transition from – uh, jiu-jitsu, the sport-based aspect of it, over to MMA, and he's like, "Man, my jiu-jitsu sucks. It's not working." That's a that's a great line. And he says he basically had to relearn what positions that he's good at will translate to getting punched in the face. Yeah. And it's it just shows you that the guy doesn't have any ego. Yeah. You know, sometimes you get, and again, today's kind of different than it was in the older days, where people were just so style dependent. And in the old days, now people are even coming in there; they, they just do everything. They train a athletes. lot. So, yeah, they're athletes, but they start training in everything as they get here. So they're they're competent across the board. But when you st you still get some guys that come from one particular background, and some right. come in with that ego, and they're just saying, "No, my style works. My style works. I don't want to learn other stuff." And pff, you're not going to make it with that attitude in this business these yeah. days. Especially just on the jiu-jitsu guy. <clears throat> I get the striking aspect. Like some of the guys that come in, they're not looking to learn the wrestling because it's wrestling's a little Til, tough Until they get put on their back and then they're looking at their corner like, what do I do now? <laughs> oh, I've, I've seen that many times. Me I know too. You, you have too. And uh, it doesn't seem like they learn from it. You know, it just seems like the strikers want to continue to strike and, you know. Yeah, go back to striking but, and then but go, that's go, back, made, go back to glory. Yeah, but that's what made Chuck Liddell so successful, right? Great striker, but I think he had a little bit of a wrestling background. But he did have a wrestling he, background. He, but he really utilized it great. In, yeah, uh, and just never accepted being on the ground. The few times yeah. you saw him taken down, it just popped right up. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, that's that's the only fight I really know about in, in 1FC. I'm sure it's a good card. I just don't know much about all the guys on there, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time talking about it. Uh, we have LFA at 119, also happening Friday night. Pretty big card for us because Josh Silvera is going to be fighting in the main event. Uh, he's already holds the lightweight, light heavyweight title at 205. Now he's going for the middleweight title. And for those that don't know who Josh is, um, A, he's Conan's kid. Um, and B, been running around our mat since he was about five years old. Yeah. And, you know, a former Arizona State uh, wrestler, and he'll be fighting in his, I guess, adopted hometown of Arizona. That's where the card's at. And he's going against Jared Ravel. Um, for this middleweight title, so he'll be cutting a little bit of weight. And he's the main event there Friday night. Um, I got Josh winning this fight. He's a, he's a little bit of a beast. Oh, man, he's good at what he does. Yeah. And, uh, but, but he's fighting a tough guy, so we'll <clears throat> see what happens. Yeah. It'll be his first real, real strong test in MMA. So, I mean, until you, till you get in there and see him, how they respond to it, you don't know. Yeah, it's funny. He, uh, just a quick backstory. So he locally, you know, he <clears throat> obviously grew up here in the area, and he went to your old stopping grounds, Cardinal Gibbons High School. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> remember him wrestling it back in high school down here, and he was just one of the meanest kids on the mat, somebody told me. And he's such a nice kid off the mat. 
you know, the, the like just such a pleasant disposition. And the, on the mat, he just used to torture people. That's kind of funny because you look at his dad, who pe- who people look at and people say, oh, God, that guy looks like such a dick. And he looks so mean. But then you grab him and you talk to him and you're like, God, he's such well, a dick. Well, hold on. No, no, he's actually like the nicest guy in the world. I was going to say, he doesn't look like a dick. Well, I don't know why. Yeah, he, he does. He looks like a mean guy. He looks like a mean dick. But off the mats, he's the sweetest guy. He's, he's the nicest guy in the world. He's almost too nice. You know, we're in our meetings well, and, and, and he's he carried away. Well, he's he's nice. away. When he's talking to us? Well, he's talking to us, it's different. But anyway, so Josh, is uh, he's got a big test, like you said. Um, this will really gauge where he's going. Hopefully he wins the title. He'll, he'll hold two belts at that point. And... Um, that's probably time for a step up. Yeah, from the I guess step the up. sky's the limit for him, and and I'm sure he's going to get together with you know his dad Conan. I'm sure he's going to get together with you. Ask your advice on you know where you think he fits in, whether it's PFL, Bellator, UFC, or elsewhere. So many options these days. Yeah. It's just great, and and each option has different pros <clears throat> and different cons. Yeah, um, and yeah. I think he should be at 185. I think he's got the frame for 185. Um, I don't think at 205, I think you're going to get just just some bigger guys in those organizations, Bellator and UFC. And, um, PFL obviously has a 205 division, so we'd have to make the move there. They, they don't have a 185er, but I think Josh would do okay over that. But overall, I think Josh is better suited at 185. You? Agreed. Okay. Uh, that's all I really know on the LFA card. So uh, good luck to Josh out there. Then we move over to the big one, the Bellator card. Um, they put together a great card coming up, and we've got four guys on it. I'll start from the bottom before we hit the main event. Achilles Mata has been on our team, I guess, about a year. Came over with uh, Miss Lipsky and her husband. So Achilles came over with them. Uh, he's a little bit of a veteran. He's got 12 fights in. He's fighting a kid named Mike Hamill. Interesting to see how that fight goes. It's his first time training with us, so I'm just curious to see how he looks live. Yeah, and, and, and he's fighting a, a, a guy who's got some, some fights too, and it's a decent veteran of the sport so it's going to be a, a good style matchup for them i think the I, I saw the odds they were they were they were fairly tight if i remember seeing the odds were on they? that yeah but i don't you know i haven't seen Killy's fight since he's been here and you know i try to just give opinions on fights when i've seen the guys fight and i got a better Agreed. feel for him and you know you, you can see how a guy does in the gym but until <clears> you see him get off the stool and get yep. punched in the face how's yeah. it translate i don't know yeah he's a slight slight favorite at minus 115 <clears> it looks like but uh again i don't know a ton of this about of his opponent and uh and if you're following along i know sometimes we do our betting segment at the end we're gonna we're gonna combine it here for you we'll talk about the fights as they're coming up here as we're talking about it but we'll also give our viewpoint on some odds and dan you'll you'll chime in with your thoughts on that as well yep um Next fight is my man, Alexandre, Alexander Shabli, not Shabili, Shabli for all you people out there, fighting Bobby King. And uh, the, the odds are probably crazy uh, as Shabli beat a favorite, but uh, I watch him here in the gym fight a lot. He's minus 550. Yeah, so he's a, he's a big, uh, big underdog. I'm sorry, a big favorite here, but he's awesome. He, he's super talented. He is. You know, King's 10 and 3 and, and, and no <clears throat> slouch, but you see – Shabley at, at minus 550 just goes to tell you how how good Shabley is and people don't really know that yet he's a yeah. little bit of a secret even though he's got a lot of fights and a lot of wins but man I, I I've seen him in here with a lot of good guys and and he is just right there with all of them he's a 55 or lightweight I was watching him last week um sparring with Gamrot I'm not gonna give too much away but man you want to talk about a spirited sparring session both guys going at it and really gaining from that session that was it, you know? Um, yeah, and, and, and Gamrot is a guy that the UFC looks upon very favorably right now. They've got, he's yeah. coming off a really good win over Jeremy Stevens. They got him in a, a fairly high profile fight with Diego Ferreira yep. coming up. So they think pretty highly of him. He's a champ, champ back in KSW in two yep. divisions. So just to put it in perspective, Gamrot's really good. And Shavley is. is going to him, and they are going toe to toe. Yeah, I'm actually <clears throat> surprised then that he's that big of a favorite. I thought he'd be a little bit more fly under the radar, but it looks like the uh, the betting gods out there, you know, have a good read on him. It's funny. I love guys like like Shavley when they are under the radar because people don't know yet. Yep. Um, and I and I, I agree with you. I thought maybe the odds would be a little less than they should be. Yeah. Um, but. Man, it looks like people caught up to him pretty quick. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to bet on that fight, but obviously I think Chablis is going to work this guy. Um, no, again, no disrespect to uh, Bobby King. I just think Chablis is a, is a really he, – he, he's a few fights away from, from a top he, spot. He's a championship-level guy yeah. in Bellator. Abs- absolutely. Yeah, I'd be, I so. I'd be surprised if he did not fight for the title. 
at some point, you know, whether right. he wins a title or not, like, I don't know who he's fighting right. for it yet, but, right. but I'd be surprised that, that guy does not go on a run and, and fight for the title over there. Agreed. Uh, the next guy we have up on that one is Johnny, and I'm not even sure what his nickname is now. Is it oh, Scissor geez. Hands, Diamond Hands? Is it is it Mr. Functional Training? Is it, uh, you know, I don't even know. I should ask Kayla. Maybe she would know. But uh, Johnny Eblen fights, uh, he's fighting Colin Huckbody, and he's just a monster, monster favorite there at over a thousand. So again, can't put any money on Johnny, although he is a stud. Dan, you want to talk about Johnny a little bit? I'll, t I'll, I'll talk about it from his coach's perspective. Mike Brown works with a lot of high level guys and who, and you're always talking with him <laughs> about, you know, who's doing good, who's looking good, who's looking bad. Who do you, how do you feel about these guys? And he just keeps bringing Johnny's name up about how much better he's getting and how high he is yeah. on Johnny. If you tell Johnny's not a newcomer to our team. He's been here what, three years? Maybe maybe yeah. a little bit more. I'm not exactly sure. But like just over like the last nine months, he's made just really big improvements and strides. He works a lot with Masvidal in that little group of guys. Yep. And, and he's just, man, he, obviously he's a, he a college wrestler, high level. Out of Missouri. Yep. And uh, But his hands have gotten good. His cardio is good. He's a really good scrambler, and he doesn't really... I don't ever see him losing scrambles. You know, he's the kind of guy that, you know, I've seen him get taken down in the gym, even though he's a high-level wrestler, but we got a lot of other high-level wrestlers right. in the gyms. But when the but when the takedowns turn into scrambles, he always seems to find his way on top. Yeah. And I've seen him st stunned in a fight and get hurt and start to go down and then turn it into a scramble. And he always ends up yeah. on top. And that's just a... That's a really good trait in MMA. Smart fighter IQ from that standpoint. You know, when you when you get your bell rung and you still have the wherewithal to say, hey, let me go to my bread and butter and and, and, and scramble for that low single. We've seen it a couple times where yep. he did it. And uh, he's looking great, man. Sky's the limit for him. And you got another guy right behind him in Austin Vanderford, not on this card, but uh, a couple heavy hitters we have in this weight division. Yeah, and I expect Austin to fight for the title next against Musasi. Whew, what a fight. I'm um, assuming all the details get worked out contractually, and, and, and that's a great fight. And Austin, you know, he was on this podcast before, and really good guy, and a, he's just a dog. You know, that guy does not want to lose anything. Good wrestling, good ground and pound. His cardio is good. Um, that, that'll be a really interesting fight if it yeah. comes through. I'm, I'm looking forward to watching that fight because I, I really like Musasi as a fighter. And uh, I love Austin, man. He's he's great here in the gym. He's a tank, and it's going to be interesting to watch that matchup when it happens. So we'll talk about that going down the road. But uh, and next, man, <clears throat> there's there's a fight we've been waiting for, and I know you've been waiting for, and I see you already grabbed it. And this fight, <laughs> lock of the year. I mean, these are the these are the fights and, and, that and you dream of. It is a master lock of the year, and it is. Former Ryzen, former Bellator, Bantamweight current champion. Ryzen. Current Ryzen, that's right, he still has the belt. Kyoji Horiguchi against current Bellator Bantamweight title holder, Sergio Pettis. And Kyoji, I think he started out at minus 150, and now it's up to minus 180 at certain sites. It depends on the site. Um, so let's call it minus 170 is what I see there with, with one of the sites have it, but it's probably going to be 180 by fight time, and I wouldn't be surprised if it inches up a little bit more. Would you? You know... Again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be biased in this. I'm just going to give you my opinion straight up. You know, I try to do that every time I see whether a guy fights at our gym or doesn't yep. fight at our gym. I think Kyoji's the best fighter I've ever seen step foot into this gym. I think Sergio Pettis is really good. Well, let's preface it by saying you hardly ever come to the gym. So <laughs> Other than every day, you're right. Um, but I've never seen anybody better than yeah. th than, uh. than Kyoji here. I mean, the guy is that good. I don't know how to... I, how do I use a more exaggerated term than that? Guys who fight for us, guys who've just been through the gym. I've never seen somebody better than him. I forgot who was here. They were doing a, uh, I don't know, filming some of the guys. And I don't remember which film crew it was. Could have been UFC. Could have been Bellator. I don't remember which it was. And one of the guys came up to me and goes, man, all anybody talks about in this gym is Kyoji. And it's for a reason. This guy is an absolute stud and I know that's an overused word and people don't like to hear it but I don't know what else to call him you know warrior whatever you want to call him best fighter that you know like you, you said it that stepped foot in our gym um, he's just that well regarded and Pettis is good Pettis is well rounded his striking's good he's the champ he's a really good counter striker and you saw when, when he fought Archuleta and Archuleta yeah. came in wild and he's a dangerous guy right in the pocket sees everything counter strikes he pieced Archuleta up yeah. really well which is saying something because Archuleta is so good yeah. his wrestling defense has gotten a little better he's a black belt in Jiu Jitsu but I think Kyoji wins every second of every minute 
of every round in this fight. Yes. And if I and if I were setting the odds, I'd have Kyoji at minus six hundred. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to see when you look at Chablis odds, you look at Johnny's odds, and they're such prohibited favorites. And and I guess it's warranted. And then you look at Kyoji, and maybe it's just you're giving a lot of respect to the name Pettis. You're giving a lot of respect that he's Bellator champ. Um, and he's a really good fighter. He is a good fighter. Like you said, people don't realize, hey, he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He's, he, you know, he's, the kid's legit, and he's a really – and you made a good point. He's a really good counter striker. The odds are fight. The odds, in my opinion, are way too low because they know Pettis very well, yep. and they know how good he is. But they don't know how good Kyoji is <clears throat> because he's been fighting over in Ryzen. Yeah. Um, they remember when he was in the UFC so many years ago, which was— Lost to Demetrius. Yep. And, and, and we, I think his that was the fight before he came over yep. to us. And when he came here after losing to Demetrius at the end of that fifth round— he was just a karate guy. He had no wrestling. He had no grappling. He was just a pure karate guy. Yeah. And he has been a sponge since he got here. Nobody works harder than than he does. He's probably the pound for pound strongest guy <laughs> in the gym. I mean, if you ever go up to Kyoji and hit him, which I love to do to the guys, give him a shot every time. He is like hitting steel, like those, you know, just like iron ore. I just hit this guy. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. I mean, pound for pound, 100% strongest guy in the gym. People ask all the time, who's the who's the hardest worker in the gym? No brainer, it's Kyoji, hardest worker in the gym, most humble guy. And we had a conversation before, and you had a good point, and we were talking about betting this fight, and your criteria was, tell me where Pettis wins this fight. And we broke it down, right? How how does he win this fight? Is he gonna knock can he knock Kyoji out? I don't think so. Can he submit Kyoji? Don't think so, you know. Um, is he taking Kyoji down? Don't think so. Can he outpoint Kyoji? I don't think so. And, and, and we broke it down on each one and went through it. Um, go ahead. I'll let you the, finish the up on it. The easiest path to, to me seeing Kyoji lose in a fight, regardless of opponent, is a big, strong guy who hits really hard, lands that perfect shot. Yeah. And, Almost like a Manal and, cape. And the, and the one shot and the one shot that Kyoji ate that did that when he was here was that fight with Asakura? Right, and he, that's a big dude who is really hard. Kyoji went in a little reckless because he went into that fight dinged up yep. pretty severely, and uh, he, he and, rushed and, it a little and, bit and needed needed surgery, um, and he got caught by it. Yep. And, and when you fight a guy that has that knockout power, you always have a path to yeah. losing a fight because it can happen. Yep. But Pettis doesn't have that knockout power. Um, and I just think Kyoji's better everywhere than he is, and that's no knock to Pettis because yeah. he can uh, he, he could be a top five guy in the world and still be, have Kyoji be better than him everywhere. I just I'm just that confident in Kyoji. Um, I would bet the mortgage on that house at those odds. I think those odds are a gift. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Speed wise, we didn't even talk about that. Speed wise, Kyoji is way faster than Pettis. I mean, he's just got the advantage on speed, on quickness, his footwork, his in and out blitzes is something that's not normal. It's tough to get a read on that as, a, as another fighter. If you haven't really practiced for that, usually you get in that practice mode of sparring mode. It's a little bit of a rhythm. Kyoji's rhythm is too hard to, to try to time. It's a very difficult thing. So his um, wrestling has gotten really good, a lot better, a lot better. And it's, and again, it's a credit to the guys he goes with and the, and the program that's put out over there and, and the quality of training partners that we have in the room. Um, but yeah, even his ground and pound, which didn't really have before, but maybe had it, but he wasn't wrestling. So he wasn't able to use it. Now it's, it's pretty funny to watch him go with guys and him simulate it when he takes them down and laughs. Yeah, I think this will be the coming out party. I think this will be the last time you ever see those type of odds. For Kyoji? Uh, those type of favorable odds in a, in a Kyoji fight. I, 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 th I think uh, people are going to really wake up when they see how this fight goes. Again, it's a fight, and it's a fight against a good opponent. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. I just, I just don't see a way that he loses the fight, which is really weird. It, it is weird, but... Um Hey, it is what it is. Styles make fights, and I think this is a great matchup for Kyoji, and it's a great coming out party. Can you talk about, Dan, like what you think you want to put bet-wise on this? I would put as much as anybody would let me put. Which is, I mean, when fight. you say that, I mean, for me, that might be that might be a few grand. For you, what is that? I mean, I... Can, can we talk about that or no? If, if you told me right now, hey, we, I've got a guy who wants to take a million dollars in action, I'd put a million dollars on him. And you're that confident. And I've never yeah. heard you talk like that before. You're not a, you're not a, you're not a drunken sailor type. Better. 
You know, you're very methodical. You're very analytical. You don't bet on shit just to bet on it. You know, you're not a big, oh, every Sunday I got to get action on a football game. You're not that type of guy. No, I, so. I really only bet fights in three college football game teams that I'm really familiar with. And I don't bet to make money. I bet because it's fun. Right. You know, it's just fun. It's, we compete. as so who can who can pick the fights it's a competitive thing. the best. Right. So even when I'm really confident in a fight, you know, what are we betting? I got my, my bookie account. At least I had it. You know, and you, you're betting a few thousand, a couple thousand, few, you know, 5,000 or, <laughs> By or the way, you brought, up, you brought up my bookie. Oh, that's could, a disaster. Could you, did you get your money out? No. Could you tell us what happened? Um, Please. <laughs> I'll finish the line about Kyoji, though. Okay. Um, so I'm not trying to bet on fights to try to make money, but. Who the fuck says that, by the way? But go ahead. But I'm not going to turn down what right. I consider free money. to almost be free fucking money. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just think it's that. I think it's like once every five years you might see a fight that you look at and you look at the odds and you say, man, normally to make money off that fight, I'd have to, I'd have to get a guy who's like minus seven hundred or six hundred, and I'm not betting that. That's stupid. You don't make any money. Right. But at one seventy, one sixty, one seventy five, one eighty, fuck. Yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. Anyway, my bookie, yeah, I. I I tried to take money out. They don't really like sending money to your bank, so you finally set up a Bitcoin wallet for me because I didn't know how the hell to do it. Say that was Coinbase, by the way. Whatever, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> set it up, and I got. You're allowed to take five thousand dollars out per week, um, and I got my first two withdrawals out, no problem. And uh, I mean, you got a decent chunk of change in there for people who haven't yeah, followed. Yeah, like I mean, 150, 150 grand plus or something. whatever. Um, I got my. I got ten grand out over two weeks, and then it just kind of. Kind of hit the bricks. <sighs> it was, you know, under review, request under review, email back. We need to identify, we need to verify your identity. Then it was send in, call us, send us in a water bill, uh, picture of your credit card, picture of your ID. Firstborn. Then it was a few days later, your picture, uh, your, your verification was denied. Please call. Called again. Yeah, your pictures came in fuzzy. Really? I'm looking at the email. They look pretty clear on my email. Yeah, send them again. I sent them again. I enlarged them. I took the pictures differently. Wait, first off, you don't need to enlarge your pictures, but go ahead. So <clears throat> send it again, and then then no response. Now I didn't even get the email response, so I waited a few extra days, and I called them back. Yeah, your pictures were fuzzy. No, man, I, I resent them. No, they were fuzzy. Okay, I'll do it again, but I'm going to ask you to hold while I send them. And then can you put me on hold? And they're really nice people in their customer service, by the way. Um, and they they go and they actually let me hold while they went and I reset them. They said, yeah, they look clear. Everything will be fine. Well, you'll get an email in two days and everything will be back to normal. And when I didn't get an email in two or three or four days, I said, motherfucker. You got jerked off. So I called them again. <clears throat> now they said, oh, well, you were supposed to send the back of the license and a selfie holding up your license and you have to send last month's water bill or electric bill, not any water, any bill that shows that you live there. So I did that. And did you have you eaten peanuts too as you were doing this? Still no response. And then I called them again. And Jesus, they, dude. They said, you know, we didn't get it. So I sent it again. And that was just two days ago. So I don't know. I think I'm going to get so my money So you said they had great customer service. Super nice guys. And ladies speaking to me. I mean, that's not great customer um, service. I will tell one other thing about them. When I got notice that I couldn't bet with them anymore, I had an open parlay. And I had, oh, I because you can, you can do parlays where if you're really confident in a couple people, but you don't know who, but you want to add it with some extra games or extra fights to try to explode a your week payout. after or two weeks later or whatever. Or you don't even see one that right. has odds left. You're like, I just, I just want to keep it in the bank so that when I see another one that I love, I can add, add to, it to it. it. My bookie had a great feature where you could just leave spots open. So I had a couple spots open on a parlay at the time and I had to call in to, to put that, that to add it. And this is after they froze my account, won't let me bet anymore. But they agreed, yeah, you have that open thing. We'll allow you to, we'll allow you to add to finish out your parlay. Um, but it has to be football, can't be fights. I said, okay. And I had a game that I liked, and I called in to add it. And I'm telling you, it took me like three hours and Jesus. like four calls. And when I finally got the guy ready to say, just as he's ready to say he was going to add it, I got this crazy static. And I almost thought they had like a static button. 
on their oh side God. to fuck with me. And I'm like, and I'm talking into the static like, come on, dude, are you serious? Come on, let go of that button. Please, come on, man, I've been doing this for hours, come on. And I finally got the bet in. It was uh, Notre Dame FSU to open up the season. Notre Dame given seven. And I think they were up by like 10 I in the fourth game. quarter. Shit and then FSU game. had that crazy comeback at, at the end home, to put in overtime. Rallying for Notre Dame still whatever. won. But uh, killed me on that one. Yeah, well, that's me why too. they let you get that bet in because you lost it. <laughs> yeah, it's the only. Uh, <laughs> so, so the bottom line is you didn't get your money out. It's still there. You got this big circle jerk. Uh, the whole time from what's what is this piece of shit called again? My bookie. I mean, again, I really liked their website. I liked everything they did. It's just, and I know a lot of people that have gotten their money out fine from them, and it was a really good functioning website. I think I just I just hit them really good. I took a grand up to like one sixty, I mean, and <laughs> and they said we don't want your business anymore, which is which is fine. But give your money back. Don't make you jump through fucking hoops. To yeah, do it. that's just it's a little bit of pain. Yeah, it's horrible, horrible publicity for them and horrible customer service. So if you're listening out there, take care of the fucking guy already. He pieces of shit. Um, so uh, I don't know how I can be any more clear about my position on Kyoji. I would bet what anybody would take. I, I, I'm that confident yeah. so in that, Kyoji I mean, in this fight. I mean, and prior, if you had your betting app there, um, that's a great fight to parlay with if you're able to keep it as an open parlay as well. Yeah, because you can take a guy that's a, at minus 170 and then you can find him with someone who's like a pick em fight that you that you really like one guy and, and you're now you're getting plus odds. Right. When, when, when you put those two together. So, so yeah, that's a that's a big fight. I think Hyoji's gonna open up a ton of eyes in the MMA world as to how good he is. Scott Coker has got a gem there and uh, I think he knows it. Um, like you said, I think it's now it's up for the world to see on the, on a bigger stage what's going to happen there. I can't wait for Friday, buddy. Yeah, I'm excited. Pretty cool. You we're actually got we're another good story. We're going to save it for next week. You're going up, up to... <laughs> Dude, you got the worst luck. You must have pissed somebody off in your life. You must have pissed a lot of people off in your life. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait until... Yes. I'll wait until... And not tell this story it's before a fucking the great fight. One. It makes the... It, it makes the... My bookie story seem so pale in comparison. It's like vanilla... To this swirl flavored whatever. Oh. Um, God, I can't wait to hear it. It's awesome. It's I, a beating. I've already heard. It. I just can't wait for you to tell it again and relive the shit. It's a beating. Um, all right, so I guess next up we've got uh, the UFC. It's going to be on ESPN 31. Man, another solid card for the UFC. They've been putting together some monster cards these, these last few months, haven't they? Man, there's two fights on this card that are just. I mean, I'd pay <laughs> money just to see those two fights. I'm with you, and uh, and, and it's going to be you. Well, hey, you know what, Primo, scroll all the way down. Let's talk about our guy first. Okay. Um, we've got uh, Zalgus on there, and he's just got a, I think you got to scroll up a little bit. Manel Cape. Yep, against who we know very well. So Zalgus against Manel Cape, and I think Manel's a favorite. Probably Z should be. Yep, and he was obviously fighting in Ryzen before. Yeah, well, he had a fight with Kyoji in the semifinals of their Bantamweight tournament. And they had a little bit of a crazy fight. There was a, they both went in for takedowns, they clashed heads, and Kyoji was actually knocked unconscious. And yeah. I, when I say unconscious, I mean he was out. Yep. And they stopped the fight, and they gave Kyoji a few minutes to wake up and recover. They look at things a little differently over in Japan. Um, as far as letting allowing guys to continue, <laughs> there was no NFL protocol there. <sighs> Man, I'm telling you, you go back to the, you go back to the kickboxing tournaments that they had over there, and like one guy would get knocked out in a fight, but the guy who knocked him out would break his hand and bring they, him back. And the guy that got knocked out, well, that means you get to continue the same night. So anyway, they they revived Kyoji. He woke up. They gave him a few minutes to recover. He then took Cape down, submitted him with a head and arm. And then went back to the locker room and came back less than an hour later and, and, and won the final to, to claim that belt. Um, had no recollection of any of it. Crazy, right? Uh, between fights, after the fight, anything. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a little disturbing how, how, how they do that over there. But, man, I think it says a lot about Kyoji. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they talked to him right after the knockout while he's still in the ring hey do you want to continue he's like what do you mean do i want to continue i'm absolutely continuing and then backstage before the final mike brown was over there with him and brown he didn't want him to fight yeah brown's like kyoji man you you've got a concussion you were unconscious great call by brownie too you know to actually give a shit about his fighter um 
before one of the biggest fights of at that time Kyoji's career. Agreed. I um, mean, there was a lot. There was a lot of money. There was a lot of yeah. prestige. It was a tournament. You're getting a belt. You're getting the winnings for the tournament. Um, and Kyoji's like, yeah, no way. I fight. You know, yeah. I am fighting. You know, yeah. no no Different conversation mindset. be had here. I am fighting. Yeah. Um, that guy is. Uh, it's just. It's just a samurai. Yeah, he is. I mean, he was born for this. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, this is going to be a tough fight for for Zalgus. Uh, he actually impressed me with his grappling. The last fight, uh, look, you know, I watch him here train. He's got a crazy fan base, by the way. Those guys are absolute animals. The yes, way they, they, are. they uh, root for their guy, and I don't blame them. But great, great dude, good grappler, better than I thought. Um, I still think it's a pretty tough fight, and obviously, I think Manal should be favored, a uh, slight favorite. He's very he explosive. Cape's just very, yeah. very explosive. And I'm not so sure how much his uh, takedown defense improved. They say it did a little bit. He's been working on that. But yeah, he's over at AKA, I believe. Okay. I'm um, not sure who he's working with over there. I think uh, I forgot the wrestling coach's name. Um, I know DC says it all the time, but <clears throat> tough fight to call. Zalgus, one of our guys. Hopefully he's able to pull it out, but... Uh, Looking forward to that fight as well. It'll be a big win if he does, that's for Speaking sure. Speaking of fights you're looking forward Actually, before we get into the two fights that we're okay. really looking forward to, I mentioned this one <clears throat> a couple weeks ago. Clay Guida, Leo yeah, you Santos. Did. You did. Um, Are you surprised to see Leo Santos at minus 180? I mean, he's got a good record. He's got some good wins on his belt. When's the last time he fought? Um, this will be like his second fight in five years. Which I is mean, crazy. He just doesn't fight. I don't know if it's injuries. I don't know if he's got a lot of stuff going on back back home in Brazil. I don't know what it is. I mean, he's he's 41 years old and and he doesn't fight regularly at all. That's um, it's crazy to me. You know when he does fight, I mean, I think I was at a fight where he knocked out Kevin Lee. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And you see then, they just released Kevin Lee by the way. I did. Crazy. And then then, then he um he had a fight with Adriano Martinez coming off Adriano Martinez oh knocking out Islam. Yes. I mean, Adriano Martinez comes out, he's the only guy to ever beat Islam Makachev. He knocked him out clean and then he comes back and loses to Leo Santos. Yeah. Um so By so split. Santos is is good, but he just I mean, I talked about the Lee fight. That was in 2015. You know, he just he doesn't fight a lot and he's older and you know, he's a jiu-jitsu guy even though he's got that that one, that kind of shocking knockout. He's actually gotten better striking. I just think uh, Clay Guida's no spring chicken himself. I think he's 39, but he still does exactly what he did five and 10 years ago. I mean, you take know what he's going to do. Take a guy down, grind him against the cage, take him down, put him down, hold him there, hair flying, couple Car punches going, hair flying again. Cardio flying. Yeah, cardio and for I'm, days. And I'm not sure he's much worse at doing that now than he was five years ago. Yeah. So I'm, and when I see the odds and he was like minus 155 or minus 160, I think I look at that and I say, man, that that's a winnable fight for Clay Guida. I could see him taking down Leo Santos and, and, and at least winning two of those rounds. Um, it's such a tough fight though, Dan, because when you don't, you know, usually you'll look back at the last few fights a guy's had, right? You don't really look, hey, if a guy's got a five-year career, I'm not looking at his amateur fights. I'm not looking at his first couple fights. And, you know, sometimes it takes a guy's feet to get wet or get settled in the right camp or whatever. But usually, hey, let me look at the last two, three, maybe four fights, even five fights deep on a guy. And look at his career a little bit And there. you can do that with Guida. He's still active. Yeah. This will probably yeah, be his at, third fight this year. But you look at Santos and, man, like you say, two fights in five years, that's, that's, that's a tough thing. And... uh I wouldn't bet on the fight, but I know you would, if you did, you would take Clay Guida on that. I mean, yeah, Guida fought in February, he fought in August. Yeah. Uh, he's just, he's active, he's basically the same as he's always been. Yeah. Um, but we'll, uh, he had a real competitive fight with Bobby Green three fights back, that was back last year. And you see that Green's gotten Oof. much better. He's yes, kind he of has. surging right now. He had that great fight with Fiziev. Well, let's segue you into know, that now. And then he just starts Diakinta. Um, but uh, I, I'd bet on I'd bet on Guida. I'd throw him into one of those parlays. I'd risk a little bit of money and blow try to blow it up in a parlay, stick him with Kyoji, um, and, and see what you can do. Yep. But uh, there's two fights in this card that just stick out that are just amazing. Yeah. So let's just jump to it. Um, Brad Riddell against Raphael, Raphael Fiziev, and uh, you know both guys have really really strong backgrounds in kickboxing and Muay Thai. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Riddell is the kickboxing coach, and I could be wrong over there at City but Kickboxing, or maybe he's an assistant coach there to some to some extent. And uh, I think Fiziev was over in Thailand, I believe, um, who now trains a little bit over in Sanford, and he's back home. I'm not sure he's here all the time, full-time, but I think he probably does 
back and forth. But what a great fight. I mean, both guys are just really, really accomplished strikers. Uh, I watch their fights. I think they're a little bit different on how they approach it. I think Riddell's a little bit more with the hands up top to the head, where Fiziev will mix it up a little bit more with those devastating body kicks. Your take? You're right. Their styles are a little different, but where they're 100% the same, they're not looking to win a decision. No. They're not looking to stay no. on the outside and try to pick a guy apart and win by points. These guys are coming to take you out. And you know what's crazy? If you, if you looked at their last, I don't know, four fights, they don't have a lot of knockouts between them in those fights, which is crazy. Well, they're, they're fighting some pretty high-level guys. Yeah. You know, they're they're they're. they're I mean, Riddell fought Drew, with Drew Dober, right? It was— Who's, uh, Tough as shit, and he had Dober well, on queer street. And Dober was the fight. favorite going into that fight. Dude, Dober hits like a <laughs> truck, and and neither guy got got knocked out almost. But they uh, both almost yeah, got. They yeah. both got hurt in the fight. He really had Dober I, dead to rights. I, I want to just drop this in there. Riddell's never been knocked out, from what I know, uh, in his career. The guy's got an looks like an iron jaw. I mean, yeah, he, he, I, I know Dober hurt him early in the fight, but Dober hits really hard. <clears> um, I saw. You know, you talk about chins. I saw Bobby Green just cracking Fazeev in the third round of that fight. I was at that fight power sitting Bobby up front. Has, though? Dude, just a, as clean a shot as you can land right. in that in that third round when Fazeev got a little tired. Um, I saw Diakasi crack him in the third round a couple of times. It's interesting because you don't really see Fazeev get hit very often in the first couple of rounds. Right. And then he just slows down a little or maybe he gets a little lazier in his defense as the fight goes on. Maybe he's just so desperate looking for a finish. You know, he does those those matrix kind of defenses every yes. now and then where he's backing up early Which in the crazy. fight. Um, I know Riddell doesn't get tired at all. That guy's just, he's just come forward one speed as long as the fight's going to go. Some guys look tired and they just never get tired, right? So like he'll, I see his mouth open in the second round in a few fights. You That's know, like Jeff Munson yes, training. It's <laughs> your face is red. You know, looks like he's gonna have a heart attack. I've got the eight that that you know that um, you know the you know you clear what's it called that AD thing up, up front. God, I forgot the name of it. No idea what you're talking about. What defibrillator? That's oh, what geez. it is. But there's a name for it up front. It looks like you're gonna have to bring it out for them, and and they keep going. It's like they've got a diesel engine there, and Riddell just keeps coming forward, puts a lot of pressure on you, stays in the pocket. He's got a good chin to stay in the pocket. That's a that's a key thing, and uh, has a really good counter right, uh, really good uh, right hand, and a, and a really good counter left. Um, I like Riddell. It's almost a pick 'em fight. If I like Riddell in this fight, if Fazeev fights really smart and tries to stay a little bit on the outside and throw those kicks that he's got, especially to the body. I mean, he just. They're brutal. It's they tough. are brutal. It, they they are. <clears throat> it's, it's tough to stay on the outside because he's I th always coming at you. Because Riddell is always moving forward, you know. And and I think the thing that separates that might be a little bit of the separator in this fight, Dan, is Riddell. And and again, he's not a takedown monster, but he has the ability to take Fazeev down, and you could steal around that way. So these guys could be slobber knocking it, you know, and it could be just an absolute war and it could be 30 seconds left, it could be a minute left and you just get a takedown. It's a little bit of an edge and then you're grinding them, you're riding them before you know it, there's 10 seconds left in the fight and this guy kind of stole yeah, it. Yeah, he shot in on Dover when he got clipped yeah. and he was hurt. Other than that, he's really just looking to take your head off. Right. Um, if I... If, the only thing I'm pretty fairly confident in this fight is I think Fazeev wins the first round. I think Riddell wins the third. Okay, and the um, second round's up for grabs. I don't and know, and I don't know if anybody survives to the yeah. second or the third round because they both come out hard. If if I remember correctly, he took down Magomed Mustafayev, who's the the common denominator for both guys. Mustafayev obviously knocked out Mustafayev. Super Mustafayev, tough. Mustafayev super had tough that crazy knockout on Fazeev, that back spinning kick. back kick, which almost knocked him out with a spinning kick to the head <clears> prior to that. Just but missed. Yes, but this one landed. As flush. flush as can be, dropped him and then jumped on him. Um, Riddell was able to beat Mustafayev, but it's interesting because when that fight started, Riddell came out and cracked Mustafayev, immediately dropped him, and it was Mustafayev looking to tie the fight up and take it to the ground, yep. even though he's more of a striker. Yep. He felt that power from Riddell and just that constant forward pressure, and he was looking to take some breaks. It was actually a split decision, but I don't think it should have been a split decision. Right. I, think, I think Riddell pretty much overwhelmed him, even though he was nullified at certain parts of the fight. I think the only weakness in his game is he can be taken down a little bit and he can be controlled a Who, little who bit. Who are you talking about? Riddell. Um, but that's not going to come into play because right, that's not what Fazeev's looking to do. But I think Riddell can do that to 
if he gets clipped, yes. I think he might look to do that, and it'll probably be an advantage. But it's just it's like in case of emergency, shatter the glass and look for a takedown. If he doesn't get the emergency, yeah. he's just looking to kill you. I, I think the uh, odds makers have it, have it right on. You know, it's a coin flip. I just like Riddell in this fight. Just I think he's got a couple things that'll put him over the the top. Um, I think I, if I had to bet on that fight, which I wouldn't bet on that fight, if I did, I'd probably agree with you because if I think one guy's looking to probably have an advantage early and one guy's looking to have an advantage late, I'll always go with the guy that's got the advantage late in my mind. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, it's not like Fazeev gets gassed out and looks like shit in the <clears> third <throat> round of fights. He just might get a little sloppier. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 you, look at, you look at the fight with Diacasi and you look at the fight with Bobby Green and, you know, they're both good fighters, Diacasi, by the way. They're both good fighters. So he wasn't just destroying those guys early and then faded out late. It was just he had the slight advantage early, and but it was noticeable. It was, it was easy to score the rounds. They were close, but they were easy to score. He won the first two rounds in both fights, um, but then he lost the third round in both fights, at least on two of the yeah. scorecards, and I thought pretty clearly. Um, but, and again, I don't know. Is, is he just getting a little sloppy? Is he yeah. looking for the finish? Is he getting a little tired? Doesn't look totally gas, but I, I give Riddell an advantage late and Fazeev an advantage early, and I think it's going to be a, it's just a can't miss fight. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes <clears throat> the the fighter's biggest asset becomes their detriment at a time. He's so powerful, Raphael, that he throws everything into every strike. His body kicks we talked about are just devastating body kicks. His his punches up top, he comes in throwing super hard, but you gas yourself out there a little bit. You're throwing you're wasting a lot of energy. So when you you throw all that power out, you better have something for that second and third round. Whereas Riddell is uber aggressive looking to hurt you but he's not overthrowing right like you say he's very controlled he's very disciplined with the strikes and he's really t he's more he's technical at it. he's good yep um but he's he doesn't look like he's throwing everything right into those shots which so. is probably part of the reason i think he's going to be favored late in the fight yeah so that, that's why i like great Rodell. fight though it is i can't wait for that fight i'm kind of pumped i mean it's a great weekend I'm really pumped if you're an mma fan to just Hey, I'm I'm pulling up and I'm watching some fights along with college football. And then Fontenaldo is Aldo the, still the main fights, <laughs> dude. He he still fights really good, dude. Watching Aldo's last couple of fights, it was like watching him ten years ago in the WEC. Yeah, and and he did an interview recently that said he was thinking about retiring, and then he just got revitalized, and he feels just as good as he did when he was young. And usually, when people say that, they're full of shit. But based You've told on what that he, a few times, based on what he looks like, I mean, I I think I believe it. I mean, if you if you look at his fight with with Jan for the title, I mean, he won the first round of that fight, and he may have won the second round. Or uh, you know, Jan started to take over towards the end of that right. second round, which he seems to do with everybody after the first round, and then he really came on like Peter Jan yeah. comes he on. He got the it. timing down and just started to overwhelm. And that's what, and that's what he does, and that's why he's. The man. He, the man. He's a guy's a fucking wrecking ball. But man, Aldo was lighting him up early in that fight. It's like significantly lighting him up early in that fight. If this were a three round fight and and Aldo was an underdog, I would say, man, this is this is one of those fights that you just have to jump on because I could see Aldo winning the first two rounds. And I'd actually be surprised if he doesn't win the first two rounds. But it's a five round fight. Font's got really good cardio. Um, he's a very technical striker. Yep. Well, they both are. I mean, yeah. they're, they're both very technical strikers. They both yeah. have a you know, great background in Muay Thai. I think Aldo has the power edge. I just think Aldo's a little bit better at it. But uh, we're talking about a five-round fight. Yeah. So how do you see the fight going? I like Aldo. You know, the Aldo how? I've seen in the last two fights, uh, I think, you think by he decision. Wins the decision. Yeah, I do. So you think he wins? I don't think he knocks Font out. All right, so if I you think, think he wins Font the decision, it means out. you think it's going to go five rounds. I do. Do you have an opinion as to who wins which rounds? I think, I know what you're saying. You know, I, I think Aldo's going to win the first three, and then the fourth and fifth might be a little coin toss there. Maybe Font takes over a little bit. Maybe the fourth Aldo still gets, but I just think he wins it. He, he's going to take this fight by a unanimous, unanimous decision. If I were betting the fight, what, what are the and odds? I, and I the might, odds are, Dan? I think Aldo's like plus one fifty or so, which is Please pretty good odds for okay, a, plus one twenty five. Okay, All okay, right. it was one fifty when we when, when we looked at the fight a couple weeks ago. So okay. that means money's been coming in on Aldo. Yep. Um, I would I, I if I were betting the fight, I'd probably look to put Aldo in a parlay as as an underdog. Yeah. Um, hoping that he wins the first three rounds. I think he's going to win the first two, and I think he's going to lose the last two. I really do. So what do you think happens round three? I don't have a fucking clue. Yeah. 
And I would be surprised if Aldo could stop anybody in the world in the, in, in the first two rounds. You know, he kicks hard, he punches hard. Um, Curious to see how much output he comes in the first round, Jose. If it were a pure pick em fight, I'd bet Font by decision, winning the last three rounds. If I were doing it to try to spike a parlay, I'd bet Aldo, hoping he wins the first yeah. three rounds. How, how old is Jose Aldo, do you know? Dude, he's nowhere near as old as you would think. I thought you were saying he's nowhere near as old as me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, you look at Aldo and you think that guy's got to be in his early 40s, right? right he's here. been around forever. He's not. Well, he is... 35. 35? I feel like this guy's been around... Forever. Another 10 years add on that WEC fighting Mike yes. Brown. Yeah, it was... Remember? Fighting before Mike Brown. Yeah. You know, uh, guys before he fought Mike Brown in the WEC. The guy's been around a long time. He's had... He's had some wars. Dan, forget about the wars here. How about the wars cutting weight and the wars in the gym? Inside the gym. Those yeah. guys used to go really hard. Yeah, and, and I bet they still go hard. You know, just kind of what they do. But also a lot of weight cutting um, takes a lot out of you over time. Yeah. So, um, I mean, listen, and let's not take anything away from Font. Font's a, a sniper out there. He's looked great his last few fights. I'm kind of impressed. <clears throat> How could you not be watching the Garbrandt fight? Yeah. Because Cody Garbrandt has really crisp yep. hands. I, I was a little surprised by that. I thought Cody was going to win that fight, but, you know, props to... Uh, font on that one. I so. mean, just, if you don't have Jose Aldo on your top five list of all time, I don't know what to tell you. I just think he's just, he's just that great. Yeah, and, he is. And, and he's still fighting at a high level, so it's hard. Well, that's what him. impresses me. His last couple fights, Dan, it looks like he's gotten rejuvenated. Whatever it is, he found the fountain of youth. He's been inspired. He's, you know, whatever has made him have this little late stage, you know, bump up in his career is, is fun to watch because he's, uh, he's an animal. And he's not even doing with those trademark leg kicks. Yeah. You know, a guy like that, I think, my God, if I can leg kick like that, I'd fucking leg kick the shit out of everybody, right? He really hasn't been doing it as yeah. of late. I don't I don't know if he's, you know, if, it, if it's injuries mounting up, if his Could hips be. don't feel like what, what they used to do. I don't know if it makes him tired. Yeah. And he's conserving the energy. But Maybe. Um, Maybe. Fun man, fight to watch. I can't wait to see it, though. He, yeah, he's just, it's it's going to be a great one. There's, there's, there's some stuff to look forward to this weekend, no doubt. Absolutely. So that, that really covers it. Hopefully you guys gleaned a little bit of knowledge there on the betting side and take it for what it's worth. And the one thing you want, we're going to walk away and tell you is bet Kyoji at minus 170, bet Kyoji at minus 180, bet Kyoji at minus 200. I'd even go as high as 250 or 300. I Kyoji. put in my mind when, when, when they told us that they were going to fight way before the odds came out and we were talking and I even said to you, I said, I think the odds will come out at minus 170. I think they should be 600. Right. Uh, I'll bet anything under 250. Once you get over that, you just don't make any money. on Right. It. <clears throat> but still a betting opportunity there for you, uh, especially if you put it in a parlay on s some of the stuff we talked about. So that's what we got going on this weekend. L really looking forward to it. Um, why don't we drop a story? Okay. So at one time when, when we were getting started, and you could probably fill in the year, there was a rumor there that you were going to buy the UFC. Now, this was pre-Fertitas and, and Dana. This is when Mr. Meyerowitz uh, controlled it with Hori and Gracie, and you got approached to it. Do you remember what year that was? It was uh, end of 2000. End of 2000, wow. So 21 years ago, almost 22 years ago, you got approached to buy the UFC. I mean, how did you even, how did it even approach you? How did this come about, Dan? So what the know, fuck were you doing that somebody would approach <laughs> you for this? We were doing we were doing shows. AFC? Um, no, this was just before the AFC. I decided to do w, the AFC after this. Was this WE? Uh, World Extreme Fighting. Yeah. WEF. With Jamie and, Levine. And we were doing shows. Um, the late Jamie wrote Levine. And we at, at, at one point were at the point where we thought, hey, maybe we can try to get these on pay-per-view. And went and met with the people at, at DirecTV. Um, I don't know if DirecTV was based in Atlanta at that time, but... That's where we went and met and basically got cock blocked by the UFC um, for being on pay-per-view. Which is through funny because they weren't that TV. big of a deal back then. Um, well, they, before they got knocked, a, DirecTV wasn't a big deal back then. The UFC, when they started on pay-per-view, it was all controlled by cable because satellite right. was just fledgling, um, a fledgling industry. Um, the UFC started to do some really impressive numbers on pay-per-view, and they 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 carried a lot of weight on pay-per-view. 
And then John McCain saw it one day. Arizona senator. Woke up and decided I'm going to jump on my soapbox, even though I'm a huge professional boxing fan. Right. Um, Such a hypocrite. Where guys are taking 500 headshots in a fight. That's great. Let me sit front row and cheer on these guys beating the living dog shit out of each other to the head every strike. But but this MMA stuff is really, really dangerous. It's human, you know, cage cockfighting. And, you know, he basically put a phone call into a buddy of his that ran Time Warner. Cable, which is one of the biggest cable outlets in the in the country, um, was and, that Ted Turner at the time? Nope, Time Warner was somebody else, I believe, at the time. They, I think, Time Warner ended up buying AO, uh, TBS or they merged TNT, or TBS, right? yeah, whatever. Um, but anyway, they they got it taken off, so you could go and you could buy porn. You know, you can watch pornography on pay per view. How do you know? Um, that's the rumor. <laughs> um, Friend told me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I liked the point when I was younger. I'm sorry. It was just me contributing to a $3 billion industry. Just me. Um, anyway. You spent $3 billion on board. <laughs> Any, anyway, he, they get kicked off, they get kicked off of, of pay-per-view on cable. Their only outlet is DirecTV. Well, DirecTV doesn't have very many homes at the time. So even though they still did well as far as a penetration rate on, on DirecTV, it just wasn't much money. Let's, well, let me ask you, did you have DirecTV back then? Do you remember? I did. Okay. I think you were one of the few guys who got it. I, I got it too. I don't remember what year I got it. But uh, yeah, I, I jumped on it pretty early. <clears throat> um, and it was the only way to watch UFC. Right. At the time. So the UFC went from being profitable and very comfortable with huge growth potential <sighs> to literally hemorrhaging money because <clears throat> they had no pay-per-view outlet other than DirecTV. So anyway, we went to try to get WEF on DirecTV. We got cock-blocked. They said, sorry, we can't put you on. UFC you know, has given us an ultimatum. So, okay, I guess we'll just keep running the regular little small UF, uh, WEF shows that, that we were doing. Um, and I got contacted and put in touch with John Peretti, who, so for those who don't know who John Peretti was, he was a matchmaker, pretty influential at the time. Well, he right? had done extreme fighting back in the day, which is... Conan Silvera, heavyweight champ. we got introduced to Conan Silvera yep. back in 95. Um, well, John had moved on from extreme fighting. He was working with the UFC. He was doing some commentating. He was doing the matchmaking. You had him commentate for one of the, your shows, I believe, right? No, uh, no he, he was left. Uh, that's right, that's right. He reffed the Minnow show. Our WEF shows, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he was scouting talent for the show. David the UFC. Um, so anyway, he, I got put in touch with him, and he said, hey, look, here's the deal. You know, we got kicked off pay-per-view. We're hemorrhaging cash. Our only hope of surviving as a company, and it was Meyerowitz in control at this point. He had, I think he had bought out his, his former Orion. partners. Yeah, I think they were all out at this point. At least I never <clears> dealt with any of them. And he said, our only hope of survival is to get sanctioned um, by the athletic commissions because if we get sanctioned by the athletic commissions, we should be able to get back a onto legit, cable. We could be a legit sport again. Yes, kind of. we will be legitimized. And do you, just a sidetrack, do you remember if they went to like Larry Hazard first in Jersey? Was that where they went? Well, that's part of the story. Right. That's part of the story I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm about. jumped ahead. <clears throat> they wanted to get sanctioned by the Nevada Athletic Commission. Okay. Because Nova Nevada is the premier athletic Be all commission all. In, 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 the, in the country. Everybody follows them. All the big fights at the time, you know, where boxing matches were, were held in, in, in Nevada. Fight Madison Square Garden. Fight capital of the world. Sure. And it still is. So their goal was to get sanctioned in Nevada. Um, but Nevada just didn't want to hear anything from them. They just they couldn't even get people on the phone. They were just they just got blown off. Sorry, we're not interested, not interested, not interested. So per, the way Peretti explained it to me is um, he said, okay, basically here's the deal. He said, we have an in with the New Jersey Athletic Commission. Larry Hazard's the commissioner. Larry Hazard has agreed to provisionally approve one show in New Jersey. I think it was going to be UFC 30 in the beginning of 2001. He said, Nevada has agreed to send representatives out to the show to watch it. Go to the weigh-ins, monitor everything we do. If the show goes smoothly, they will then take it back to their commission and consider sanctioning shows in Nevada. 
He said, so literally this is a be all end all for us. If we, if we can put on the show in New Jersey and it goes well, and Nevada then approves us, New Jersey will approve us if it goes well, obviously. He said, we are back on pay-per-view and we are off to the races and we're gonna grow this thing and make it into a monster. And, and then do you think, just to take it a step back, when they originally, Nevada didn't want to take their call or anything like that, do you think it was the boxing factions that were heavily influencing the people to just say, hey, we don't want any competition, or they didn't even see them as competition at that point? Boxing has never embraced mixed martial arts, right. at least back in the Don King and Bob Aram when they controlled right. everything days. So that would not surprise me. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really know that world very well. Be interesting to um, you hear about a lot of unsavory things, especially back then that went on in boxing and their influence. Um, shit, you hear about it to this day. Yeah. And there's a lot less of it today than that people are going to get away with. Um, I don't know. But, Curious. But, but they, just, they wanted nothing to do with it. And part of that is you're going to blame the early UFC for the way they promoted themselves. You know, if you go back and you look Dude, at the way that's MMA why I was, watched it. <laughs> yeah, me too. But I mean, it was promoted back then. <laughs> Two men enter, one man leaves. I, I, I mean, no rules. Fight to the death, you know? Two it's flying like flying out in the cage. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, it was great. But they kind of made their own bed because they thought that they had to make a splash when they came out there to get people's attention. So they, they really pushed how dangerous it was. <laughs> <clears throat> and then, sword there. Yeah, so so they they, they kind of made their own bet in that regard to a certain extent, um, you know. But when you think about it, how many shots to the head do you take in a boxing match? How many shots do you take to a head in a football game? Right. If you're I an mean, off, offensive lineman, you're taking multiple headshots every single offensive play. Fifty. Yeah, 60 we, times we can a get game, off so. into a different tangent. Right. Uh, so about getting NFL, back to the story, so the New Jersey show was basically make or break. Was it in Trump's guys. place that they did it? It was gonna. It was in the Taj Mahal. Yes. Yeah, I remember going to that show. I think so. They they put me in touch with Meyerowitz, and basically their situation was everything is lined up. We're gonna do this show. They're gonna come and watch it. If things go our way, we're gonna be on pay per view. We're gonna be off to the races. But we're out of money. We, we need a we need a little infusion of said, cash. I can't do the show. I'm out of money. I'm broke. What did they ask you for? I'm entitled. He said I've got money coming to me from a Japan show we did, a UFC Japan show that they had done earlier in the year. He said, but it just takes a long time to get your money <laughs> out, out of the people that we co-promoted the show with over there. He said, we've already got a gate of X dollars on the books. I don't remember what it was, sold in, in the Taj Mahal. Um, this is what I've been making in pay-per-view, which is not big, but here's what it is. So when you look at the money I'm owed in Japan, the gate money I've got, plus the the pay-per-view that I'll get out of that show, <clears throat> I've got more than enough to do the show and pay you back. W w were I his books money. open to you? Were his books open where you can go in there and look at them, or was it? According to him, were they open, or did they end up being open? I mean, Bob Meyerowitz is a whole other story, which might as well trash him like I trash everybody else on this show, the lying fuck. Right. Um, but he basically said- Why are you being so nice to him? I need a, I need a partner. Um, I need a loan. I need something to make- something happen here. Um, I don't remember exactly what he asked for, but I remember what my counter was. Right. Um, but then did, did he, did he want a partner at that point or, or did he really just say, Hey, I can't get a bank loan. Can you I loan me some fucking cash? I think he wanted a partner. Okay. He was looking to bring in a minority partner who could bring in the cash to fund that show and fund the buildup after they got regulated because he had a plan. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to get regulated. I'm going to get put under the auspices of the Nevada commission. I'll do my shows in Nevada until all the other commissions jump on board, which they will. Of course. Um, we'll be on pay-per-view and we'll grow. So he wanted someone to fund that period of Growth. time. It was going to take for the revenues to come in and catch up I to blind. what you had to spend yeah, yeah. To, to, to grow. So I don't remember what his offer to me was. Um, my counter was, I will buy 51% of your company from you. Um, I wanted to own more than 49% so I could have a say because I didn't trust the guy after you know, having a glass of water with him, which turned out to be spot on, well warranted. Um, and we made the deal. I said, I will buy 51%. I'll give you $500,000 for it. 
I will put a million dollars in an escrow account. Now, now we're going back 20 years, so a half a mil back then was... Uh, it's more than it is now. <laughs> fucking more than it is now. Um, That's for but, sure. But the real, the real carrot that I was offering, it was I asked them, I said, what is it going to cost you, before I made my offer, I said, what is it going to cost you to carry this company to get to the point where you can start making some good money? Because you're going to have to start doing shows. You're going to have to carry this thing while you're getting regulated by Nevada. It's not going to happen overnight. Probably a year's worth of time, right, Dan? Um, I mean, they were only doing, you know, four shows a year. year or something like that. I don't know exactly. Back in two, the early on, they were doing a few a year. Back by 2000, 2000, late 2000, they may have been doing five a year. I don't remember exactly. But I said, how much money is going to cost you from the time you do this show in New Jersey until this company's bringing money in and it's comfortable? It's profitable. And he said a million bucks. So I said, I'll give you 500 grand for 51%. Um, I'll let you run it, you know, with me. Um, I've got another job. I don't have full time to dedicate to this. To, to this. Um, and I'll put a million bucks up to fund the company. And a million would be an escrow and, and take and it, it as an uh, as needed basis. Yeah, drawn down by the company to cover its expenses, expenses during, as during this buildup. Um, Were you excited at that point? Because... Let me just backtrack a little bit. Man, you were doing jiu-jitsu. I was doing jiu-jitsu with you back in the day at Conan's gym down in South Beach. Those were awesome times, right? You were, we were all watching the UFC at that point going, holy shit, this shit is fucking crazy. You were doing some small shows in the WE, WEF before we jumped into the AFC and you started doing that. Were you pumped up about this? Were you excited or were you like, waiting? Or you were just so busy with your other stuff. You were like, yeah. I was actually a little worried about what kind of time it would take to ramp it up to, to try to, to build that company because right. I knew that's no small undertaking. Right. Um, I was really busy with my other companies. I remember. At the time. And whenever I had free time, I wanted to train. Yep. Um, we were just building our team up. We had some guys that had started fighting and I was probably more interested in Getting them there. having our guys have a place to fight and having a sport for our guys to fight in that could potentially grow and you know God forbid become mainstream at some point right. in the future. I was probably more worried about that than I was about hey how much money can we make building this thing up. <clears throat> I always thought back then I thought man this sport is this is the greatest sport I've ever seen in my life. The only reason it's not doing gangbuster numbers is because people don't know it exists. Yeah. You know, and I knew nobody knew what the hell it was because every time I'd go into work and, you know, I'd be busted up from something or my ear was getting a little color flowered and people would ask me what the fuck happened. I'd try to explain it to them. What the fuck is that? Oh, you do karate? Yeah. That's what you'd always do. <laughs> so it was. But, and no, Dan, the, probably just to cut you off there, the reason why it didn't blow up is there was no social media back then. Could you imagine the viral videos that would have blown the sport up? Uh, exponentially I mean, at that time. There, there wasn't a ton of internet back then to right. begin with. So I was just thinking this thing just needs to be on TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if this thing can get on TV eyeballs. and get eyeballs, it will blow up because what's not to like? Everybody I've ever shown it to at that point on my VHS tapes thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. Of course, they were all idiots like I was because that's why they were in my circle of friends. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I was probably more motivated by just trying to keep the sport alive and having a place for our guys to fight yeah. <clears throat> than trying to make money on, on that side of it. So we made that deal, basically right on those terms. He was, he was fucking desperate. He needed the money. And he needed 200 grand like tomorrow. And now, just to ask, he couldn't have gone to a bank then at that point and done it? With a dying business that, no. Not a chance. Okay. His only his only option was to go to some investors that would that, that investor would some like coin. that, you know, maybe a loan shark, which yep. um so I made that offer. He said yes, but I need the money immediately. I've got to start funding this show that's that's coming up. I'm I'm behind on my bills and, and the front money I need to get this show going. So I brought my lawyers in, we drafted a contract. It was those exact terms, fifty one percent, five hundred grand, a million dollars in escrow to fund the company. And literally within that that week, we got something signed. I funded the 200 grand. It was put up as my down payment. I had a due diligence period of 30 or 60 days. I don't remember. 
Um, at the end of my due diligence period, I had to fund the million dollars in escrow. Um, and then the closing was right around the same time. So we signed the deal. I stroked the check for the 200 grand to get that show going. Um, and at this point, I just want to say that I don't think this guy gets the credit or at least the acknowledgement that he deserves. If Larry Hazard hadn't stepped up and done what he did and brought that show to Atlantic City, I don't know. I don't know that there'd be an MMA right now. I don't fucking know. And what's crazy I mean, is he comes from the boxing world. For those that don't know who Larry Hazard is, man, he, he comes from the boxing world. So for him to embrace it with open arms is kind of opened your eyes a little bit. Like, wow, a little bit, little bit of surprising. There. Yeah, and, and, and after that show, him and Nick Lembo, who was working as the lawyer, I believe, at the time for the Athletic Commission, they got together and started working on the unified rules and pulled some people in to help out, like Big John and, yep. and Joe Silva and some guys. And, and I mean... That guy is stud. Yeah. He should, he should be MMA royalty for, yeah. for for getting it off the ground and what I he mean, did. I mean, that guy should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, you know, agreed. For UFC Hall of Fame to acknowledge what he did for the sport. So anyway, we make the deal. I fund the 200 grand. I've got a whole list of stuff that I, I need to close this transaction from a due diligence standpoint. You don't just go and throw a million dollars up to fund a company in addition to a half a million to buy your interest in without knowing what the fuck's going on in the company. So I start requesting a ton of stuff from Meyerowitz, and I got some stuff pretty quickly, but it was nowhere near everything I had asked for. It was you started to feel you were getting jerked off a little bit. The huh? format I got it in was was a little shady. Um, I mean, I'm asking for like financials and shit, and I'm getting fucking. A fucking note paper with shit scribbled on it and stuff. And, I, and I'm starting, my, you know, my antennas are going up. Like, what am I getting myself into? And, you know, give me all the contracts you have for these fighters. And, you know, okay, well, my, and his, his brother was a lawyer in New York, um, David Meyerowitz, if I recall. And, and he was like the intermediary and he was sending me the stuff. And I wasn't happy with the flow of information and, then it just completely stopped. I got like, I couldn't get a return call. Um, I don't know if there was email back then in 2000 when I was doing this. Or if I was not getting emails back, they went dark on me. I couldn't get the lawyer to call me back. Wow. Um, so I'm starting nice to, to treat your partner. I mean, I, especially when it just strokes you $200,000. So I'm coming up on a deadline where... I need to fund a million dollars into an escrow account to cover a company. You know, I'm going to have control of that company because I own 51% of, of the company. But I'm going to be in bed with a guy at 49% who won't even return my fucking phone call, who at this point, I'm looking to fly up to New York and find him and beat the shit out of this guy. Um, so I had it at minus 1,000, by the way. <laughs> so... <laughs> I was like losing my mind. And your money. And then somebody told me, somebody from Vegas. Fuck, what Do you remember? I, I don't. Somebody told me that, hey, he got another deal. He's selling the entire company to these guys out of, out of Vegas, the, the Fertitas. And... One of the Fertitas was on the Nevada Athletic Commission yep. for a while. So obviously has incredible contacts there. And their pockets go way deep. And at that point, I remember thinking to myself, wait a minute. Those guys could really take this thing and fucking inject some rocket fuel into it. And they got a much better chance of this thing being successful than I would have. Yep. You know, I was going to do three shows a year, keep the show small, try to build up a TV deal, yeah, draw wait until we get back on pay-per-view. I'm going to have other people doing it for me. I can't put a lot of time into this thing. <laughs> Plus, I got our team. Yep. You know, and, and, and I remember thinking at the time, man, these guys could take this thing and really kill it. If this thing can succeed, they got a much better chance of succeeding than I ever would. They got better finances behind them to to handle it when it's doing sh if it does bad to begin with um and 
probably a little bit of a conflict of interest anyway, having a team and having the promotion, which right. I didn't even think of at first, right. but I remember thinking of it at this point. And I just thought, man, you know what? I'm better off if these guys take it and then, than if I take it. And then you say these guys, so you mentioned the Fertitas, but it was Lorenzo Fertitta, his other brother, uh, Frank, Frank Fertitta, and Dana got involved, And, and right? Dana had a piece of it. But, uh, but at that particular time when they told me about that, I didn't know the individuals. Gotcha. I just knew they were casino guys in, in, in Vegas because right. I was a... You know, yes. I used to partake a little bit in the gambling side of things back then when I was younger and riding high and making money. Um, I did know he was on the Nevada Athletic Commission for a which while. Which is so strong. Um, which I just blew me away. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, those guys were like so untouchable. They're not returning phone calls. I'm hearing stories from Meyerowitz and Peretti that they can't even get these guys to give them a minute on the phone. You know, this guy was on it. Yeah. He'll get this shit, he'll get this shit sanctioned if anybody like can. That. Yep. So... At that point, I was like, okay, let them buy it. Get you know, they'd already back. signed a contract, you know? And yeah. it's like, my wish has never told him about me, he never told him the thing was already under contract and he couldn't sell it to him. Maybe the fucker was probably trying to sell it twice. Um, <clears throat> so you were already 200 in, in, in the tank with, with Meyerowitz. Yes. UFC gets bought out by the Fertitas and you're not even really privy to that at the time. I heard about it before it closed. Um, so it's kind of like you went to the altar and your, your soon to be wife was already just got married, but Hey, by the way, Dan, <laughs> no, this was a bad thing at the time. <laughs> that may have been, what's wrong That's with that? Bad. Good call. <laughs> Actually, this turned out to be a really good thing too, I think, um, because of, you know, what they were able to do with it. But I remember thinking at the time and saying, I'm not going to go in there and say, Hey, motherfuckers, this is my deal. Let me try to kick this and force it. Right. I thought about, hey, let me reach out to these guys and say, hey, fuckers, I got a contract that precedes your contract. Make sure Meyerowitz, since he won't call me back, make sure he gives me my 200 grand out of the closing and, and make me whole, you know, or right. I'm going to fuck up your deal. And then I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Those are probably not the guys I want to start off on the wrong foot with if they're going to be running this company. You know, my my goal, my dream is you know, build up the biggest team in the world. And that's then when I sell my companies, I'm gonna spend my last 30 years or so running this fucking team and being there every day and going to fights. I'd rather these guys be my friends than start off on the wrong foot and be my enemy. So I said, I'm not fucking saying- Shrewd no move. I'm not saying a word to these fucking dudes. Um, I'm just gonna take the route through Meyerowitz. So, I mean, I remember leaving a message with Meyerowitz's brother's receptionist saying, hey, look, I hear he's got a deal, no problem. Give me my fucking 200 grand back. I'll wait until your deal closes to get my 200 grand back. You know, I'm not going to get in the way. I'm not going to try to screw up your deal. Just give my fucking money back. Do you, do you think Meyerowitz runs something with uh, Bet Online? <laughs> my book. <bookie, laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, they bought the company. We yep. know what they did with it. Um, he refused to give my 200 grand back. He refused to, I had to sue him. So, <sighs> what a scumbag. So, sued him. That probably dragged out a couple of years. You know, at that point, I was just pissed off. And uh, when aren't you pissed off? I was I was making a lot of money back then, and thinking I don't even care about the fucking money. Just make him spend a bunch of money in, in attorney's fees, and if his brother's doing it, you know, and it's not costing him anything, make his brother fucking so busy he can't do other shit, and it's really costing him opportunities of billing other people, even though the scumbag probably billed everybody else at the same rate and made up the hours. <laughs> um, so it dragged out for a couple of years and then it got to the time where it's like, Hey, you know, we kind of got to go to a trial and you got to put some time into this thing too. And, you know, I think he had moved to Florida at the time. My attorney said, and, you know, you're really not going to get anything. He's got it, probably got it in his wife's name anyway. And I don't know what the fuck his attorney's saying. He doesn't have any money, so you're not going to collect, but I'll give you like 25 grand to go away or something like that. I think I took it. <clears throat> um, and, and by that time. You know, we were just so focused on building our team. I was kind of happy at that point that the deal had come the way it went because, A, those guys exploded the company and they did an amazing job. And took it to the next level, no obviously. No way the UFC would have grown to be anything near that if, if, if it was being run on our side of things. B, the team grew the way I wanted the team to grow. And that big part of the reason it grew was because of what the UFC did for the sport. Yep. Um, but even if 
I could have gotten lucky and, and built that company up big. I couldn't have done ATT at the same time. So if, if you had said, hey, you can go back in time and buy that company and grow that company and sell that company for a gazillion dollars, you know, but not do ATT, I, fuck, I'd rather do our team. I mean, I, I'd have more money than I have right now if I had done that and it worked, but I'd have a whole lot less shit to spend it on. Yeah. You know, and, right and now, so. Would, would, you, would, would you have a better stake somewhere? No. Yeah, I mean, at some point in time, you know, you know. You, you fucked me over. I mean. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could pay you more than minimum wage here at, at at I would have had a golden pass to but, all the shows. But you, you, you really you, fucked me over. But you, but, you know, you probably don't want to get paid more than you're worth anyway. So, That's for damn so sure. Minimum wage that is a cup good. of coffee is all I fucking need. So, you know, it, it all worked out great. Um, Agreed. I think what what those guys did with the with the company is amazing. It gave an opportunity for a lot of people to to do a lot of things. Certainly opened the door for us to grow our team. And, no doubt, and we have a lot of fun doing what we're doing. No doubt, so. and and it's funny because people I still kinda, would like to have my two hundred grand back. Well, one hundred seventy five back. I'd like to get one hundred seventy five back plus yes. interest. But I guess people what they don't realize is. Um, actually, a couple things. First off, when you were doing these small shows, whether it's WEF or AFC, you never did it to make money. You never did it to get bigger and have a bigger show. You did it so our guys could fight, get the experience in cage, and then move on to the bigger shows, whether it was a Bellator or at that time it was Pride or UFC. Yeah, but That's back what it then, was all about. If you think back then, you guys would be in the UFC and their record's 3-0, and yeah. you know, 4-0. and and, and I remember thinking, dude, I'm 2-0. and I'm thinking... I don't want our guys going into a UFC when they don't have any fights, and the yeah. first time they get punched in the face or get put in a bad situation, <laughs> they're you know they're on, on the big show. We need to build these guys up. We need to have small shows. So so when that fell apart, that's when we said, hey, let's let's go do the AFC. So so what's funny is well, just to drop some old school shit on there. You know, it started with the hook and shoot. You know, you, you were flying guys down to Jeff Osborne's show, and Miguel Iterati was the matchmaker at the time, I believe. And you know, this is late nineties. Yep, and Carlone helped out and. We did some hook and shoot shows, and you were flying guys down there, and you're saying, "Shit, it's costing me X amount of money," you know, flying guys there, paying some of their salaries, going, going myself, the hotels, all the shit we did down there. Hey, man, maybe we could do it here locally and do the same thing and the same concept, and and not and, lose any more money than we're losing anyway. Yeah, and and that's how the AFC was born. But it really wasn't to say, "Hey, we're going to make this into some big thing." It was to give guys on a local South Florida scale, and it didn't only benefit our team it benefited everybody in the state of florida and from, beyond yeah so oh. i mean shit man you had jen's pull on the show you had matt Hume on the show uh we had a ton of guys that was awesome to watch guys, guys. from japan yeah matt, matt Hume breaking pain peter's arm which was great um anyway there's just some funny stuff back then we'll go into that, that was kind time. of a mean fucker back then i love matt you <laughs> and, and, and i don't know if people realize that matt Hume was really fucking good damn good he was really fucking yeah, if good. people don't realize that they're just not Watch probably still store. fuck a lot of guys up. Yeah, he's uh, definitely a tough dude. I'd love to get him on this podcast. He's awesome, old school guy. It's kind of weird. So what? <laughs> so <laughs> no, he's a, no doubt. No, but, he's, a, he's a fountain of knowledge. Yeah. So I mean, that's you know, that's that's the real reason why you know you started to do all that. It was never to make money, and, and you helping out the UFC at the time, or what you thought was helping him at the time, it wasn't about making money and doing all this thing. Although that might have been a byproduct of it, but uh, it was really to get our guys some experience in the cage and, and get moving from there. But the other byproduct of everything is, man, how many affiliates do we have, Dan? 40 plus affiliates, all the instructors that make money, everybody that has benefited from MMA as it's grown, its own cottage industry is, is a, is a, is a, um, Big feather in the, in the Fertitas caps and Dana's caps and what, what they've done because Dude, there's guys that ha that open their Joe Dojo whether it's a jujitsu place or karate place or whatever and they they stick MMA on the window and they're attracting students because of what the UFC has built right you know it's just it's it's opened up a whole new industry and there's a lot of people making a living off that and you know do they pay the percentage to the fighters that everybody wants to see them get paid I mean I'd like to see the fighters get paid more money than they get but there's a lot of people making a living. Through being agents and and running gyms and being coaches and and being you know, fighters, people who clean our mats, the fighters. There's there's a there's it's a, it's a lot of jobs created by absolutely by what they did. Here here's one other funny way of looking at it. I remember um, when they started struggling. I mean, they spent a lot of money when when they bought it. Do you remember? I forgot what show it was, and we went there in Vegas. Man, I'm, I'm gonna say their first pay per view. It was was it Tito? It was their first big pay-per-view. Was, was it Matchchenko? 
Maybe. I don't remember. I think it was Tito Matchenko. But I went to go buy a, I said, it's, hey. It's the show that Hallman fought. Dennis Hallman fought. Uh, Pulver. Uh, Jens Pulver. It was yeah. super boring. And the, was, the whole show was, the whole show sucked. Yeah. I mean, that fight was just one of the It was their first big Vegas show, I think. There was a lot of heat between those guys, and it it turned out to be a boring fight. But I remember going and saying, oh, shit, let me go grab a program. And I remember going downstairs, and they're like, yeah, we're done. They had a little kiosk to sell some shirts, I think, or something. like, dude, they're not selling a program here. What the fuck is up with that? You always get a program at an event, whether it's a baseball event. They couldn't afford the printing for it at the time, is what I was told. I I remember being at a show where there was no programs. I don't remember if it was that Vegas show or not. It was. I remember telling you. And I remember remember texting Dane and saying, hey, dude. You guys don't sell programs anymore? It's like, fuck, man, those things, are we lose money when we sell those fucking <laughs> things. But they, 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 they went balls deep right from the get-go. <clears throat> they spent a lot of money. I think they wanted to speed up the process of turning it into something. Right. Um, which probably wasn't the greatest decision in the world at the time, um, even though it probably you know, sped up their ability to get on TV and get the deal that they were able to do, which exploded the company. But they went pretty deep in the hole, as has been documented and people have talked about it. <clears throat> I remember getting a call from Dana saying, hey, man, I know you were, you know, you were in this thing at the beginning, potentially, you know, you got any interest in getting back in and, and ask, and I remember asking, well, what's the situation? And he's talked about, you know, the Fertitta saying, man, we're, we're out of this. We're out of here. This thing. They were close to it, right? They were, they were right there. And then I guess they rehuddled and said, fuck it. Let's take the shot with Spike TV and the ultimate fighter. But just before that, when they were getting to that point, Dana's like, I, I, these guys are going to bail. You know, they're, they're going to pull a plug on it. And I remember, say, I remember asking him, uh, "Okay, how how deep are you?" And and he told me the number, and he said, "Yeah, they're looking to you know maybe get out of it, and you know if we can bring somebody in." And I remember saying, "Okay, how deep are you?" And he told me how deep they were, and I said, "Okay, and what would they want to get out of it?" And he said, "I said, hey Dana, you know what's a what's a diplomatic way to say go fuck yourself, you know?" And I remember hanging up with him saying, "Holy shit, did I dodge a bullet not getting into that fucking mess?" Mm. Um, now I want I wasn't going to spend the money that they spent. Right. I was going to take that thing so slow. I was going to take it at a snail's pace until the TV deal was done, if we ever got it, and just just survive. Yeah. And, and their big break was they like you said Dan, they went on Spike TV and the fi- the finale with Forrest and Stefan Bonner and that kind of I mean the whole show exploded and, and you they can, had some great personalities back then. Do they? Had great know? guys you look at who who, who started and on that Diego show. and Lieben and it's, but, it's well documented you know, I, like I, you said. I'd, I'd say that you're right and that was a big break if somebody came in and said, "Hey, this is our idea and our concept and we're going to fund it and you guys can do it." And they said, "Okay, this is our chance." But if I recall, that deal was those guys had to come up with the money. They had to pay all the production costs. Yeah. They had to go out of their pocket and and double down or triple down on whatever they had already lost on the company and take another risk. And I thank God they were Vegas guys and, and, and used to gambling. Yeah. I love know? the gunslinger so, mentality. That's awesome. That's so, fucking yeah, great. It's a, it's, that's an old story, and it's, it's pretty cool. We dropped a lot of names in there. You know, throughout the throughout the history, so yeah, if you're so a fan of the that's, sport, that's that's the way it went down, and I think that story has a happy ending. Can I borrow two hundred thousand? <laughs> you pay me back? <laughs> I just want to put it on the QG. <laughs> yes, I'll pay you back after his fight. Oh shit, that's crazy, man. That's fucking crazy. But then we ended up doing AFC shows. UFC did their thing. We grew our gym out. Everything worked out for the best. Obviously, um, pretty cool that you were involved in that and privy to some of that good stuff. And I'm still waiting on my. Golden Pass, by the way, you screwed me on it. I could have had that. It makes for a good story for a podcast that nobody listens to. Good call. Good fucking call. Um, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that story. Dan, anything else? We're going to want to wrap this up. Anything else we want to talk about? Oh, a couple questions people have asked. You got time? You want to throw it out All there? All I got is time. Well, you ain't got the fucking money. You might as well have the time, right? So a couple people had I had asked on our YouTube community channel, hey, what do you want to hear? So uh, one guy asked, uh, I think it was The Eskimo, Thoughts on Triad, the, the thriller show. I didn't watch it. It's not really my thing. I know Albert Tumanoff fought on there, and he looked pretty good. Um, but, Dan, did you get a chance to watch it? I saw some clips of it. I did not watch the whole show. Um, it's a great opportunity for guys to make money yeah. because they are, they are not underfunded. Yeah. Um, they they had actually reached out to one of our guys who couldn't do the show because it was, it was late notice. But uh, – the offer was very substantial, and he's looking to do something with, in the future. Um, it was well attended. It was well received. You know, Tubinov got an opportunity. He was itching to fight. He made a nice little payday. 
Boy, I hope Albert Tumor, I'm speaking to him, man, I really hope that guy gets a shot back in UFC or Bellator. He is such a phenomenal fighter. Um, He's really good. Really good striker. He was in the UFC back in the day, got cut. I think he lost to Leon Edwards is when his, he got his cut. His grappling and wrestling was suspect back Which then. Which is crazy and, for the Russian guy, right? You would he, think he's he got, got exposed on a little bit back then, but he's certainly worked on it since then and improved it. And he's he's a real good fighter, and he still is, and, um, and, and he can make noise. I, he, I, I'd be surprised if he didn't get didn't get his shot. I was going to say on the try. I, think, I, I don't think they're going to be able to continue with the boxing versus MMA right. you know, storyline forever. They're going to have to just develop stars and, and, and do it. But like I said, man, it seems like everything those guys touch works and they make money on. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of it. I don't really like the music part of it. You know, just show me the fights. Right, right. Gotcha. Next question was, um, I think it was from Rolando Fisher was the guy who asked it, was uh, asked us to break down Riddell's fight against Rafael Fiziev and his striking. I think we already kind of went over that. Yeah, know, I think Riddell's a high-level striker, man. I think he looks great. Usually most most his hands. Stays in the pocket well and, and has a great right and check left hook. So that looking forward to that, that fight. That fight is going to be fireworks. Um, what else was here? Oh, somebody, I think it was Oliver, and I forgot the last name. And he says, hey, uh, would Poirier have success at 170? I could tell you this. Dustin's a big kid. He's got a big frame. And, Dan, I think you made the point. It depends on the matchup. Right, you got a lot of wrestling centric people in that welterweight. Um, you get division. a guy cutting down from one ninety five that is just going to look to take Dustin down and hold him down. You know that could make for a a, 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 a boring fight at one seventy. You get somebody that wants to go in there and bang with Dustin Poirier, <laughs> one fifty five, one seventy, one eighty five in. That guy has got. Some really, really good hands. I, I saw some poll. I may have been on MMA Junkie recently or somewhere, and it was like, who's got the best boxing in I the UFC? I saw that, too. It was like Peter it Yan and Max Connor, Holloway. Connor, Max, Yan. And, and Dustin thrown, wasn't on there. May have thrown Calvin Cater on there. All good guys. And I'm thinking, how the hell is Dustin Poirier not one of those choices? Oh, shit. I mean, that you talk about just power, <laughs> technique, ripping the body. Yeah. Um. The gas tank to do it just as well in round five as he does in round one. I mean, he, Dustin is a finisher. So, yeah, well, I'd, I'd actually go up, I'd be surprised if Dustin does not fight at 170 at some point before he's done. First, he's going to grab Could a title. Could be a super fight. First, he's got to grab a title, then he's going to figure things out he's from there. He's got some work to do first. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think it was uh, Tony Baloney, great name, by the way. Uh, he asked the hardest hitter in each division. It's kind of tough to go by, but I mean, if you look at the heavyweight division, obviously it's Nganu. Um, Light heavyweight division, I think it's Maheta. If it's you talk, it's talking leg kicks, I'd go ray kick. But uh, boy, ray kick does have some nasty leg <sighs> kicks, doesn't I, he? I saw it here. Uh, I saw some, yeah, crazy shit. Maheta um, throws bombs. Um, he's got the hammers in his hand. Middleweight, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't really put my finger on somebody. Costa, you know, we you float that name out yeah, there as far as a Costa, heavy hitter. Costa throws hard. Um, yeah, most of the guys at 185 aren't, you know, that one, yeah, one Izzy's a sniper. punch. You know, people yeah. don't want to say Izzy. Izzy's a fucking sniper, man. You know, you even, you know, Gaslam's okay. You know, um, you There's know Whitaker. No monster you know, knock. Tank. Guy. Whitaker's yeah. more of a volume guy, right. though. That's what I mean. It's so um, impressive the way he mixes everything up. But it's not just the one knock, one shot knockout power. Right. Rumble Johnson, you, you, if, if he's, if he, no, he's, you, you know what? He's you might say, you might say mind. like Alex Pereira, who just got into the UFC, the, the kickboxing guy who's a few five, you know, but I haven't seen his hands yet. I saw the knee, yeah. right? But you haven't seen all that. Yeah, Maybe nobody really jumps out to me at 185. And then uh, even at welterweight, I, I don't know if there's a heavy hitter there. All those guys are pretty good strikers. You know, whether you're talking about Masvidal or Luke or, you know, Stefan, uh, Stephen Thompson, you know, there's a lot of guys there. Um, good strikers, but not you know Ponzinibbio, not, another good striker, not but the one shot knockout. Right, power there's not a, there's not a Tyson guy there or George Foreman. You go, oh shit, look at this guy, got um, some at 55. Yeah, who's your guy at 55? Chandler hits really hard. Uh, Gaethje, Gaethje stands out, right? Gaethje hits really hard. Um, there, there's not a guy that stands out. I'd, I'd say Gaethje in my mind is the guy that has some. Some dynamite in his hands. Yeah, as far as it's just one shot, Chandler hits as hard as anybody. Gaethje hits as hard as anybody. Yeah. <clears throat> Those are the two guys I, I would say. Um, and then featherweight, it was it was funny. As soon as we went to featherweight, there's a guy that pops out of my mind. I've been talking about him to you uh, for a long time. Is Josh Emmett. Big fan of him. His power is, is fucking crazy for a featherweight. And the one B to that was Jeremy Stevens. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah, those guys. Both. Their fight was amazing. It was. It was. Both, both guys... Uh, 
two tough uh, yeah, guys with, with big power behind they're, them. They're going to hurt you. Uh, 135, Dan, who jumps out to you? Jan. Yeah. I mean, that guy throws so hard. Yeah. Um, and again, he's just, it's like, he doesn't, you're going to say, well, is it the one shot knockout power? He doesn't throw one shot. Right. I mean, this guy is, he's throwing bombs. Once he, once he gets your timing down, he's just a, just a killer. Cody Garbrandt's got power. At one, and, well, and, now he's 125. Oh, that's right. He dropped down to 125. So right. maybe, maybe he'd make the list for 125. Yeah. So 125 is, is he your guy? Yeah. Okay. I'll go. And then, you know, let's just jump over to the women's I mean, side. Davilson Figueredo throws hard. Yeah, but I, but I think I I'd go. Women's Cody. side. I mean, it's for me. It's a no brainer. Yeah, it's a no brainer. Thirty five and forty five. It's a, it's Amanda. She she hits like a like a dude, you know, and and has the power to knock anybody yeah. out. Cyborg cyborg swings hard, but she does. We saw when they fought, look like a look like a man hit a little harder. True, good point there. Um, one twenty one twenty five. I'd, I'd go Andrade. Jessica Andrade moved up. She has she has knockout power. Yeah, one of the few women in that division. Agreed. And then 15, I don't know if there's anybody there that just jumps out to me. You mentioned a name. Uh, yeah, I would I would go at 115 with uh, Marina Rodriguez. Right. She, uh, she she throws with pop. She does. Um, you know, I don't know. Is it big, big power compared to some of the other people on I mean, the is list? there big power at 125 in the men's division? No. You know, compared to other guys, it's really not. You know, it goes it goes with size. But I, I she cracks hard. Yeah. Um, Joanna cracks. You know, she decides to come back and fight, which there are some rumors that Is she, she? What's up with what's uh, up with the Queen? Um You know I, anything? I think the Queen's starting to get a little bit of an itch. Is she? Yeah. The, so so we'll see. The itch to come back here to the States and train and do some MMA. Uh what are the type of itch you talking about, pervert? <laughs> why does your mind go there? Is that why is that why it's a three billion dollar industry? Yeah, I think you uh you might be hearing something from Joanna. Coming up. First quarter um, of 2022? I, I don't know. You don't know. Who should I ask? Joanna. Okay. Let's bow, get on. bow down, get on let's, your knee. Let's get on the FaceTime and, call and, with Joanna. And request the Queen's yeah. permission to speak. All right. So uh, hopefully we answered a few of your questions there. Um, anything else, buddy? Oh, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to finish this off since I got you on the hot seat here a little bit with a just a lightning round. Throw some names at you and get some feedback from you. Light me up. All right. Uh Probably people, a lot of people don't know this name, but Hunter Campbell. He's the UFC guy. He's probably second in charge there, Dan. Am I right or wrong on that? Um, right hand of God? <laughs> what would you call him? I'd call him sharpest dude in the room. Um, I, I think a lot of people don't realize how influential and how sharp Hunter Campbell is, and he's, he's not as old and hasn't been around as long as a, as a lot of people are. But, man, that guy is... A, and you little, don't, a little bit of a beast. Yeah, he, you don't say is, that about a lot of people. I, but. Man, you, usually you think, oh, I'm a sharp guy. I can talk to guys. And, you know, you sit back and you, you talk to other smart guys. You think, yeah, you know, this is good. That guy's fucking sharp as fuck. Yeah. He, uh, and and he, he handles a lot of stuff in the UFC. He, he handles a lot of things in the UFC. And I don't know if it's, you know, maybe... Dana is, you know, before maybe it was Lorenzo was the guy in the UFC and Dana was the guy running everything, but Lorenzo was the decision maker at the end of the day or, you know, and I was in the timeshare business, we used to call the TO, the takeover, when you need to close a deal. Maybe Lorenzo would come in and TO certain things if Dana needed some help. But now, well, now, now Dana's Lorenzo because, you know, they sold out and Dana's the number one guy. And the number one guy doesn't want to do all the day to day all stuff. Tell that me needs, about it, that Dan. Needs to be done. <laughs> So, Fucking so cock. I, I, the way I I see it, I, I see Hunter's moved into the Dana role, and Dana's moved into the Lorenzo role, and, and Hunter deals with a lot of stuff. But, but, but Hunter's got, you know, Hunter's a lawyer. Hunter's as connected as anybody in the world in in, in a lot of industries, mm -hmm. and and he gets it. And that guy impresses the shit out of me with with, with the things he does. And I don't think people really know all the things he does behind the scenes. But yeah, he's a uh, he's a mover and a shaker. He is, he? and he's a good dude. Cool, that's good to hear. Um, Scott Coker. I love Scott. I love him back in the Strike Force days. I um it's kind of funny, you know, you see, you know, Scott's he runs the a, a very big promotion, you know, that that's owned by <coughs> Viacom that's got a lot of money. They, they they do big shows, they pay big money. He's a mover and a shaker. But it's almost like when I talk to Scott, it's almost like I'm talking to another fan. Right. You know, it's like you know, I talk to a lot of promoters and things, and it's like, hey, man, okay, I'm, I'm on the ATT side. You're on the promotion side. We're talking about this and this. And, you know, when I talk to Scott, it's almost like, hey, man, we're just a couple of fans talking fights. 
And it's like, instead of, hey, you know, we're thinking that this would move the needle if this guy fought this guy, you know, what would you want that for this guy? And is he available? And Scott's like, hey man, wouldn't that be a good fucking fight? You know, and I'm like, yeah, it'd be a good fucking fight. Well, yeah, I know a guy, yeah, let's make it happen. Right. You know, Scott's, Scott's awesome. Yeah, he's done a lot of stuff from Japan to W, uh, I'm sorry, to Strike Force, and uh, was on the UFC briefly, and now he's back to Bellator and doing that. So yeah, that's a, that's a, he's a cool dude. We got a chance to meet him. Down, I got a chance to meet him down here. Spent some time with super, him. Super, super good, good guy. Good guys. Um, Manny Diaz, current head coach of the Miami Hurricanes. Got a got a little something on him. Um, nice guy, personable guy. Um, Get out. I don't blame a lot of people down here. Blame Manny Diaz for where the Hurricanes are. Right now, I don't, he's the last guy in the world that I that I blame for the situation the Canes are in. Blake I, James is the I, guy I, you blame. I blame the former athletic director who just got let go for bringing a guy in. I don't think Miami is a job for a first-time head coach. You know, I think Temple's the first job. You know, or you know, Rutgers is a first job to 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 get in there and wet your whistle and cut your teeth. And I uh, I don't think he. I think he was a little overwhelmed and. I think if he had another five years, I think he's gotten better at certain things. Um, but fuck, man, if, if sports is a results-oriented business, and if you walk into a McDonald's and the person at the register is rude or doesn't isn't attentive, doesn't go take your order, ignores you, types it in wrong, and you get chicken nuggets when you ordered a cheeseburger, what happens to that person? They get fired. You know that happens in every walk of life. In every business. And if you're a coach of a sport and your team is underperforming, you get fired. So, yeah, my opinion is that's what should happen. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with you on that. If you had to put a, a percentage on it, Manny stays or goes? I know we'll probably know something by this week, by the time this podcast is out, something will probably pop. But what would you put the percentage at? I think there's people in both camps, and I think it's political, and there's a lot of politics that go on in people don't know at that. University yeah. of Miami. I think I, at any school, I probably, think it's, right? I think it's greater than 50% that, that Manny's not the coach next greater year. Greater than 50%? Is it 75%? Is it 90%? Is it? I'd say 70. 70% that he goes. That he goes. Gotcha. All right. So speaking of going. Well, what a crazy year of coaching in college football. Man, USC made a tremendous hire in, in, in grabbing Lincoln, Lincoln Riley. Riley out of OU. I mean, that's just huge that he's, what he's going to be able to do. And then how about the, LSU's counterpunch to that when they didn't get the guy they oh wanted? Man, like Brian a day Kelly. later, they're raiding new, uh, Notre Dame's closet. From and, Brian Kelly. Holy shit. Yeah, and then you're probably going to have Luke Fickle jump from Cincinnati to Notre yeah, Dame. Yeah, there's a rumor the uh, state police have been called and they shut down the airports <laughs> and the roadway so Fickle cannot leave. That's unbelievable. To go to Notre Dame. And then you didn't even talk about the Gators who you hate so much and they got rid of Dan Mullins and Pulled in the guy from, was it Louisiana? Louisiana. Uh, uh, what was it? Louisiana Tech or Louisiana yeah, Billy State? Billy Napier. No, just Louisiana. Louisiana, gotcha. Billy Napier. And uh, he's now in Kirby Smart's uh, That's backyard. An inter- it's an interesting hire for, for them because he's not the big name coach, the big splash yeah. that a lot of teams want to bring. I mean, you, talk, you, you mentioned Lincoln Riley going over to USC. <sighs> he immediately had five stud D commits. Including the guy's probably the best player in the country the for next Malik. year. That, that are that guy are not only decommitted from Oklahoma, he already committed to, yeah. to LSU. You talk about just crazy waves. And Florida, I mean, Florida's a big job. It's a big school. It's SEC. They've got money. You know, they went the other route. They went and they had a guy that they identified as being a really good coach and a really good recruiter. You know, who's done really good things on a really small small scale. Um, and they said, we're going to go and we're going to take that route. It'd be really interesting to see how they both play out. And, and isn't it funny, two years ago, Dan Mullins, we were sitting back here because he was kind of a name that was in the in the hunt for the Miami job. And we're like, oh, he went to Gators, you know, and look at the season they're having a couple years ago. I think Mullen was a safe pick. He was never a really great recruiter. Um, I guess my point is he had, he had a down year there, and it's like, see you later. But, man, he had a down year after... A few good Fucking years. Kyle Picks, Trask. He had, he had some good years at Florida. Kadarius Tony. So these guys left. His cupboard was a little bare. So maybe he's just not a good recruiter. I don't I, know. I, I was talking to I was talking to a friend of mine who's you know, nineteen generations of Gator fans. I hate his guts, but his, all his brothers and sisters went there, and he lo- lives for him. And I remember at the end of the last season, saying, you know, you don't lose that type of talent from your team and expect to come out and play like gangbusters next year. I don't care how good you are, how deep you think you are. Look at Clemson. Trask was the best quarterback they ever had as far as a pro prospect. I know Tebow was probably the best player they ever had. Happened to be a quarterback, but he's not really a quarterback. Ugh, 
God, I hate him. Um, he's actually a really sharp guy, and I love watching him and whatever yeah. everything he does except quarterback in the Gators. But they lost Trask, who was a stud. Kadarius Tony was a stud. Playing for the Giants Pitts, wide receiver. Pitts was a freaking monster, the best college Atlanta tight end I think I've ever seen. And Miami's had some really yeah. good college yeah. tight ends. They lost some really good players. And I'm like, I, you're going to struggle this year trying to come back from it. If you don't think so, look to LSU a couple years They won a ago. national title and then dumped and it. And then they came back and sucked because yeah. they had all their talent left. Look at Clemson. And they're in the ACC. You know, they had a lot of – they had talent come back. They just lost that generational quarterback, you know, which is Ooh. also which is yes. also hard to, yeah. to, to rebound from. So, man, <laughs> Florida pulled the plug quick on Mullen, um, which – I kind of respect. I do. You know, do you do it or do you do what the Canes have done over the last 15 years they and just, you know, just go deeper and deeper into the, the abyss? Shit. Yeah. So I, I'd rather my team be a Gator that even if they overreact, you know, at least they're just not t- bending over and saying, you know, give me more. No shit. You know? Let me bring so, in the same, same old, you know. I mean, there's no fun being five and seven every year or whatever it is. No, it you sucks. Know, it's, uh, I, I'd rather be at the bottom. And then be able to springboard myself to the top. I don't want to squeak by yeah. NC State. I don't want to squeak by Pittsburgh. Yeah. I don't want to. People are people are getting excited because we beat the shit out of Duke. It's Duke, man. You know, if it was Duke basketball, I'd be excited. It's Duke football. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Come on. Anyway, let's end it on that note. Um, we'll save some other stuff for the next uh, next show. Should Go be a, Should be a great weekend of fights this week and then the following week is even bigger and we got to figure out either we're doing a show here or we'll do it live in vegas all right so uh we'll come back next week and tell you we told you so yes on kyoji horiguchi san and let you count the money just don't don't forget how much money you lose by not making it when you don't bet wow words of wisdom there all right also guys uh, i'm gonna wrap this up thanks for uh following along don't forget to subscribe to our illustrious channel punching in podcast don't forget to share it don't forget to like it comment and uh get the word out help us get the word out and blow this thing up appreciate everybody daniel anything all good all right we're out